Hi, I'm Suri Moon, co-director of the Global Health Center of the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies. I'll be speaking to you today about the role of international cooperation in controlling the ongoing coronavirus pandemic. At a time when the virus has demonstrated beyond anyone's imagination how deeply interconnected we are globally, uh, what we need to see is much more extensive and more profound international cooperation than we've seen up until this point. I'm going to go through three areas, uh, each in turn, that, where it's really critical that we have international cooperation. The first is the sharing of information and research across borders. The second is ensuring the manufacturing and access to scarce health products, such as masks, goggles, gowns, drugs, vaccines, and diagnostics. The third is financing to make sure that money is not a barrier to putting in place effective containment measures. At the earliest stages uh, of an outbreak, especially when there's a novel uh, pathogen that's been found, such as the virus that causes the ongoing coronavirus uh, pandemic, at the earliest stages it's really important that governments and scientists share information as quickly and as thoroughly as possible so that the global community can understand what's happening. How is a virus transmitted? Who is most susceptible, most likely to become ill? What is the progression of illness? What are the symptoms? And how do we actually put in place uh, important measures that are necessary to actually break the chain of transmission and to care for those who are already infected? As you can see from this slide, this epidemic has uh, hit, of course, countries in East Asia first before moving on to Europe and North America. What this means is that countries uh, must learn and can learn a great deal from countries that are earlier uh, or, or uh, that have progressed earlier through the epidemic cycle. What you can see on the slide in the black line is, of course, the number of new cases per day in China. You can see how those cases increased over time, and as public health measures had an effect, those cases came down. You also see the same pattern in the dark blue line being represented by South Korea, uh, in the light blue line um, by, uh, by the, in the red line by Taiwan, and in the uh, light blue line by Australia, where we're already seeing some encouraging signs that containment measures are having an effect. And so governments need to exchange as much information as they can with each other as quickly as possible, and it's the same thing with uh, scientific researchers, to understand what are the measures that have been put in place Countries are taking different approaches, actually. They're implementing different, different public health measures at different times, some countries much earlier in the epidemic cycle, some countries later in the epidemic cycle. We need to know what are the measures that governments have put in place, what, are the, what kinds of evidence do we have of how they work, and we also need to know what measures are governments putting in place so that people are not uh, unduly harmed by these lockdown measures. So for example, how do we make sure people have enough income, enough food, access to medical resources for those who are not infected by the coronavirus but have other ongoing health needs? All of this is really important uh, for countries around the world to be able to put in place uh, the, the um, containment measures that will be both effective but also minimize harms to, uh, to society. We also see now, if you look at the black line again, that after an epidemic has been brought under control, as it has been in China, that there is a risk uh, of resurgence. There's a risk that when lockdown measures are lightened, as containment measures are gradually removed, that we'll see cases uh, begin to grow again as people begin to move and the virus begins to, to circulate again. So we're watching very closely, particularly in countries that are further along in the epidemic cycle, we're watching very closely to try to understand, again, what are the measures that are the minimum and the most targeted necessary to get something under control so that society can continue to function um, without being unnecessarily uh, impeded by uh, important public health measures. Another area where the sharing of information and research is absolutely essential is in the research and development of health technologies such as diagnostics, drugs, and vaccines. Uh, we've had an unprecedented uh, mobilization of scientific effort uh, over the last couple months. We have uh, clinical trials, about 600 clinical trials that are now taking place uh, across the world. And what is really important is that researchers are sharing information as close to in real time as possible and sharing the most data 
data as possible with each other so we can all understand better what are the most accurate and rapid diagnostic tests, for example. What are the drugs that are going to be most effective in treating patients, let's say, in the earlier and the later stages of the disease? What are the vaccine candidates that are most promising so we can put in place arrangements to ramp up production as quickly as possible? All of this requires that both governments and researchers share information, again, uh, as thoroughly and as quickly as possible with each other so that everybody can benefit and, and be able to put in place um, uh, and, and to use the health technologies that are currently being developed. I'd like to share with you uh, in, this, in this slide uh, an analogy for how scientific knowledge uh, uh, how scientific knowledge advances and progresses. It's really quite similar to the building of a brick wall. You start at a, with a strong foundation uh, in terms of understanding basically aspects of, of a particular virus or pathogen. And then every single one of those clinical trials, every scientific researcher that's currently conducting research is, for example, contributing a brick to that wall. And the more those bricks can be put together, the more we have access to all of that information, the faster that wall can be built and the stronger it will be. However, if some countries or some researchers withhold or delay that information, it's like when bricks go missing from that wall. And that wall is not going to go up as quickly as it needs to, and it's not going to be uh, as strong. So we really need everyone to be sharing information um, as quickly and as thoroughly as possible. The second topic I'd like to cover today is the manufacturing and access to scarce health products. We know, unfortunately, that there have been uh, shortages of masks and other basic personal protective equipment for health workers and others who are particularly vulnerable to infection. Uh, we've also seen, unfortunately, that governments have put in place export bans. They've blocked the export of products that are manufactured in their territories uh, in order to first reserve those products for their own populations. And from a political perspective, it's understandable why political leaders who are accountable to their um, own constituents want to, of course, serve their own constituencies first. However, from an international level, this is absolutely disastrous. And so what we've seen, unfortunately, is that products are not reaching the people and the countries where they are most urgently needed to actually get an epidemic under control. And at the end of the day, this is quite short-sighted at the global level because this means that the ed epidemic continues to burn, continues to be transmitted uh, uh, across borders and will continue to, to, to grow and to spread. And so what we need at the international level is cooperation in terms of manufacturing enough masks, enough uh, gowns, enough drugs and vaccines and diagnostics equipment so that there's enough for everybody and to make sure that there's agreement that export bans are absolutely um, not acceptable and that countries need to ensure that their countries that have manufacturing capacity uh, need to commit to making sure that that manufacturing uh, capacity is shared uh, with the rest of the world. And this requires a depth of international cooperation that we just have not yet seen uh, in the ongoing uh, in the ongoing outbreak. This has already been a big challenge for masks, as I mentioned, for diagnostic tests, even for the chemicals that we need to run those diagnostic tests. You can imagine in a few weeks' time, when we understand more about which drugs are effective, this is going to become an even uh, bigger, an even bigger problem. Uh, what this also means is that because export bans are likely to be put in place, we need to make sure that manufacturing can take place in a number of different countries. This is not the moment for monopolies. And what this means is that we need to ensure that intellectual property, for example, is managed in such a way that we allow for multiple uh, countries and multiple companies to be manufacturing products, such as drugs and, and diagnostics and and uh, at chemicals. This also requires a certain degree of international cooperation. It also means that we need to pool information between countries so that manufacturers of these products know how much do I need to produce? How am I sure that I'm going to be paid and that I can pay my workers and my suppliers? We need governments to come together to say, uh, this is how much we're going to need, this is how much we commit to purchase from manufacturers of these essential commodities so that there's enough for the world and we can stabilize what is currently a, a highly chaotic situation in terms of supply and demand of essential, essential health products. This brings me to my last point, which is financing. 
financing at the international level is absolutely critical to make all of this happen, to enable the research, the information sharing, uh, the planning of production of commodities and ensuring equitable global access to these commodities. All of this, uh, in order to have this happen, we need to have um, some degree of pooled international financing. And we heard a couple weeks ago that the G20, uh, the leading group of the 20 largest global economies, came together and committed to inject $5 trillion into the global economy. However, most of this money is going to remain at the domestic level. Governments are going to inject that money into their domestic economies. But what we also need is greater commitment to pool some of these international resources and to spend that money internationally. Just to give you one example of how we've had difficulties doing this, the World Health Organization, which in many ways is the nerve center of the global response to this outbreak. And, and has been uh, a central repository for a lot of this information that I've mentioned is so essential that it's shared internationally. The World Health Organization uh, has been starved for resources in many ways. They made an appeal uh, two months ago for about $675 million to fund their own response and to support some of the poorest countries. It took uh, over six weeks for that money to be mobilized in the middle of, uh, uh, of a global pandemic. And so we cannot have this kind of delay. Now is not the time that we can afford to starve the brain, the nerve center of the global response. We cannot starve that brain of oxygen or of the food that's necessary to make international cooperation work better. Uh, in short, uh, what is necessary is a wider, uh, a more extensive, level of international cooperation than we've seen up till this point, and in fact a deeper and a more profound degree of international cooperation. And this is what it's going to take to really get this pandemic under control. Thank you.